Hello, you're watching People's Dispatch. It's been a dramatic week or 10 days in the United Kingdom. We've had, of course, a very uh, interesting Supreme Court ruling, which has ruled the Rwanda immigration plan as unconstitutional. We've had former Home Secretary Swela Breverman being fired by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. And most importantly, of course, we've had tens of thousands of people consistently taken to the streets in support of Palestine, in solidarity with Palestine. To talk about many of these issues we have with us, Dr. Edward Anderson from Northumbria University. He's been working on a wide variety of uh, topics which we're today going to be talking about, including, for instance, the diaspora, especially the Indian diaspora and British histories of migration and ethnicity and multiculturalism. Thank you so much, Edward, for speaking to us. Thank you. Right. So first of all, I wanted to start with uh, two connected topics, uh, the Rwanda immigration plan and Swela Braverman itself. We know that the plan was uh, declared unconstitutional. And a couple of days later, it may be an unconnected, at one level, an unconnected decision, but something that, of course, has been building up for a time. We saw that one of the key architects, one of the key uh, proponents of this immigration plan, that's Swela Braverman, was fired by the prime minister. So maybe could you take us first through the context in which she was fired because it also connects to the other issue we're discussing today, which is solidarity with Palestine. Sure. So um, Braverman uh, was fired um, actually for the second time. Um, previously, she had been uh, a minister in Liz Truss's government, who was um, Rishi Sunak's predecessor. Um, and she was fired from that position for breaching ministerial code, uh, for sharing documents um, with people outside of the government. Uh, and then this time she was fired once again. Um, and, you know, there's different interpretations on exactly why that was. But it came shortly after an article uh, that she wrote, she published in the Times newspaper, one of the, the leading broadsheets in, in the UK, in which she criticised uh, the Metropolitan Police. Uh, and uh, in this article, she criticised them for what she claimed were double standards, uh, for not acting more forcefully uh, to suppress, essentially, uh, uh, demonstrations by pro-Palestinian protesters. Um, and these were were kind of claims that, that the police sort of pushed back on. They said that they were essentially enforcing the law. Um, and there was nothing unlawful about these protests. Um, but it's thought that, you know, one of the key reasons why she was probably pushed out uh, was that, you know, she'd just gone uh, too far in, 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 you know, time after time, um, uh, making statements, very controversial statements that, that, that either went against government policy or government rhetoric and in this case probably publishing this article without heeding um, edits that, that the prime minister might have suggested right it's uh, interesting you mentioned uh, that aspect that of course it might have been that she went beyond government policy or just government rhetoric because a lot of mm. what she says definitely is popular among at least the conservative party and she sort of tried to recast herself as the a different face from rishi sunak but coming back to the issue we started with, which is really the immigration policy, one, uh, you know, you get the feeling that uh, just because she is fired and just because the Supreme Court has declared the Rwanda plan unconstitutional doesn't mean that it really affects what this conservative government or the party in general sort of views as the correct approach uh, towards immigration. So maybe could you take us uh, through both that kind of approach which this government has followed? as well as the specific uh, plan regarding Rwanda itself, which of course is the most controversial bit, but is only part of what is a larger policy framework towards the issue. The government's policy on immigration has been extremely hard line. You know, certainly uh, the, the, the most harsh uh, uh, immigration policy uh, in theory of our lifetimes, uh, certainly in terms of the kind of rhetoric that they've used against immigrants. Um, and, you know, that's been spearheaded not just by Braverman, but, you know, everybody really in that government has been been pushing for it. Um, and certainly Rishi Sunak kind of remains committed um, both to the specific Rwanda policy and the broader kind of rhetoric against immigrants, um, which 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 really seems to kind of surpass anything we've seen before recently. Um I mean, the policy of, of, of the, the Rwanda policy, essentially, the basic idea is that some uh, asylum seekers, uh, particularly those that arrive in the UK on, on small boats over the channel, um, that they ought to be sent to Rwanda to be processed. Of course, you know, 
all governments have a, a legal obligation uh, as well, uh, you know, not to mention a moral obligation to um, to 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 process claims for asylum. Um, but the government wanted to instate this policy in which they would, uh, through a financial arrangement with Rwanda, send asylum seekers to Rwanda to have those claims processed. And then if their asylum claims were successful, they would stay in Rwanda or uh, another sort of safe third country, as they were called. Um, but no one actually ended up uh, going, although the government has already spent, I think, about £140 million pounds on this policy so far, and it will cost much, much more going forward. Um, probably a, an awful lot more than it would cost for, for um, asylum seekers to remain in Britain. Um, nobody went. So the first flight was scheduled for the summer of, of 2022, uh, but this was cancelled after legal challenges, um, partly on the, on the understanding that no proper assessment had been done to see whether Rwanda was actually safe for asylum seekers. And it was felt by the courts, including most recently the Supreme Court, that um, there was evidence that, that they might be sent either back to their home countries to face persecution or that Rwanda itself might not be safe. Uh, and this was deemed to be in, in breach, possibly, of the European Convention on Human Rights, of which the UK um, is a signatory. But Sunak remains committed to this. Um, and in fact, uh, as does does um, Braverman's uh, uh, successor, who, who in his kind of inaugural social media sort of video, which is um, which which, you know, he put up the, the day uh uh, you know that he was appointed he said you know he, he reiterated this mantra of of uh stop the small boats um and you know so it's become a kind of government that has been obsessed really with migration it's it's obsessed about migration perhaps it's just run out of ideas and in many other ways you know its policies have, have failed to bear fruit and and you know britain you know is is you know they, they, there's a there are a government that are tanking in popularity as well um, and it seems, you know, very likely that they're going to lose the next election. And and this this very sort of harsh rhetoric on immigration seems to be one of the only things that they that they that they are keen to talk about. Right. Of course, in this context, uh, coming back to another area of your uh, academic expertise as well, it's really the question of uh, you know immigrants and immigrants, so to speak. Of course, we are also at a time in the UK and even globally, for that matter, when there's quite a bit of celebration about the fact that descendants of immigrants are in positions of power. You know, there's this, uh, in both parties for that matter, there is a, a fair degree of representation of descendants of immigrants in various, uh, say, levels of authority, for instance, both at the local level and the national level. And at the same time, we have a government on the one hand, but even for that matter, uh, sections of the opposition, which are not really sort of lived up or really fiercely oppose the government on this. But so what explains this sort of you know, on the one hand, a certain kind of celebration and, you know, chair or, or, you know, a highlighting of that diversity. And on the other hand, the prevalence of such a fierce anti-immigrant rhetoric as though uh, poor people coming from Africa, poor people coming from parts of Asia in very difficult circumstances are really the threat to the country. Mm. I mean, it's a curious situation. I mean, we've gone from a situation in which, uh, you know, when I was born um, all the way back in 1984, uh, there was not a single person of colour in the House of Commons. There was zero representation. Um, and things have obviously changed very significantly since then. You know, the fir first time in, in my lifetime was in 1987 with the election of four Labour MPs of colour. And then things have shifted quite dramatically, uh, or, or well, maybe not dramatically, but certainly, you know, steadily over the years. Um, uh, although, you know, although, you know, there are many, many, many uh, you know, conservative ministers at the very, very top of government who who, who are who are not white. Uh, the Labour Party still, you know, has has a considerably larger number of, of MPs of colour. Um, so, so this question of representation has has kind of, you know, the, the landscape has changed quite dramatically in that that respect. And you know, it's a very significant moment that we have uh, a, a, an Asian MP, an Asian um, a prime minister, Home Secretary. Other very very senior ministers, uh, as well as of course the the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, uh, and a huge number of of, of front benchers, uh, both for the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. So this question of representation has has been you know really really significant. 
Um, however, you know, that ne doesn't necessarily translate into policy. Of course, you know, for, it has in, in, on, on many occasions uh, a lot of kind of important uh, uh, kind of radical progressive politics has come from from MPs um, uh, for, who, are, who, are, who are people of colour. However, that's not not necessarily been the case. And it certainly has not been the case for the Conservative Party. And a lot of people have been very critical that that, you know, a lot that progress has not necessarily been made in terms of the sort of policies that that um, a lot of uh, a lot of these leading ministers uh, are putting forward. I mean, Braverman herself uh, has spoken of a, of a hurricane of uncontrolled immigration. She's she's talked about the failure of multiculturalism, the misguided dogma of multiculturalism. Uh, she speaks of 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 of, uh, of planes going to Rwanda as her dream. Um, uh, although she isn't isolated in in this, I mean, her rhetoric has probably gone further than many, although, you know, we mustn't forget that Priti Patel, her predecessor, was also, you know, very eager uh, uh, to, to impose very draconian uh, anti-immigrant policies. Um, and yeah, it's a curious thing. I mean, how is it that the MPs who themselves come from uh, backgrounds, you know, that are dependent on immigration, their parents uh, um, migrated? Um, Braverman's parents uh, migrated um, to, to Britain from, I think, Mauritius and, and Kenya, respectively, although are, are of Goan heritage. Um, why is it that they have have adopted this very harsh line on on immigration um, and and you know have have essentially you know fanned the flames of of quite a lot of um, uh, tension in this country um, in regards to immigration over recent years? Uh, right. Of course, that uh, brings us to also something which is really very current, I think, for all of us, different parts of the world, especially both for media academics as well, which is really the uh, protests in solidarity with Palestinian people that are taking place. We know that especially the UK, along with the US countries, in the global north and countries in the global south, seeing tens of thousands of people uh, taking to the streets almost every weekend uh, in mm. solidarity with these protests against Israeli occupation as well. You've been I understand part of some of these protests as well. So on the one hand, again, we have, say, someone like Bremen and Section, and for that matter, both conservative and uh, labor leaderships opposing the question, you know, opposing even the possibility of a ceasefire and, you know, at the most willing to only talk about what is called a human humanitarian pause, which is quite farcical. And on the other hand, I think we have tens of thousands of people, I think the biggest such mobilization since the Iraq war taking place against uh, the you know against Israeli policies, Israeli, Israeli offensive as well. So we maybe also talk talk a bit about the internal climate, the political sort of mobilization that is taking place on this issue. Yeah, I mean, there's been in this country um, uh, outrage at um, uh, the situation in in Gaza, at the um, the humanitarian crisis that has evolved um, uh, evolved uh, as a result of of this sort of constant attacks on Gaza. Um, uh, the huge, huge civilian death toll, including more than five thousand children, this has caused, you know, a huge amount of of angst and and uh, uh, sorrow and and anger and and there's been a, a really um, very uh, a substantial and and um, and uh, uh, sustained um, uh, series of, of protest marches taking place really every single week. Um, I'm up in Newcastle. There's been vigils and marches and rallies taking place on a on a on a weekly basis, um, in, and you know sometimes more than once a week. In London last weekend, there was a march of at least three hundred thousand people. The organisers think that it might be considerably more than that. Uh, as you say, that the biggest rally of its kind, march of its kind in the UK since uh, the Iraq War in two thousand and three. Um, you know, a, 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 a protest movement in 2003, uh, an anti-war protest movement that, of course, was was unsuccessful, although a protest movement that, you know, that, that um, correctly predicted the, the 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 crisis and enormous bloodshed that would result as, uh, from, from those from those conflicts. Um, that being said, you know, in spite of, of there being, uh, you know, a huge number of people that are that are totally um, in in absolute shock and horror at, at what's going on in in Gaza, the the political establishment seems to be uh, unable to call for a ceasefire. Both the government of Rishi Sunak and the shadow um, uh, cabinet, the, um, the the Labour shadow government of um, or cabinet of uh, of Keir Starmer, 
um, will not even call for a ceasefire. That his his line is is that that they could there might be a pause um, uh, rather than a ceasefire, and certainly no sort of strong condemnation of of Israel. And as a consequence of that, you know, a lot of members of the party have 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 walked out. There's been a sort of mass um, quitting of the party, including from many councillors. Um, and there's there's a lot of a, a lot of anger at that. Right. Uh, of course, also, I guess in the coming weeks, we're going to be seeing more protests of this kind. And I guess uh, the question uh, of immigration as well, continuing to dominate, uh, I think, as well as for both activists and the news cycle in the coming months. Uh, thank you so much, Edward, for speaking to us, for giving us an insight into some of these issues that are currently you know, dominating uh, British politics, as well as I think also dominating the protests on the street. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's all we have time for today. Do keep watching People's Dispatch. Also visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms.